Jones. I'm so glad you chose to come. Kind of had help when the schedule had some things deleted. So, <laughs> oh, now I have a captive audience. Um, for those of you that do not know me, I'm Amber Nelms, and I'm the director of institutional effectiveness. And anybody else out there? Um, so, as director of institutional effectiveness, I help. 71 or so units with their institutional effectiveness plans and if you don't serve on the tie committee just a little bit about what that means is every unit of our college has a plan where they set for expected outcomes um, all of our academic units have student learning <coughs> outcomes and our service areas i like to call them they have more service-based outcomes, things that they hope to achieve within their specific areas. A lot has changed um, with IE ever since I started in 2018, trying to just work at, kind of always had a three, three word focus, meaningful, manageable, and intentional. I feel like assessment is an ugly word. A lot of people hear assessment um, we, we talk about that formative and summative assessment that happens in the classroom, but, but we also need to think about assessment on a much grander level, like uh, programmatic assessment, institutional assessment. So um, there's a lot of reasons why we do it, but does anyone want to just throw out like the most important reason why we do it? No. <laughs> oh, well, it is required. But let's say even more important than that. It drives what we do. Say it again. It drives what we do and what decisions we make as far as how to serve the students. Absolutely. There we go. So if we don't go away from today with anything else, I want, I hope we can come to a shared agreement that the reason assessment and institutional effectiveness is important is because of our students. Um, I think it's easy to get caught up in our, our work and what we do every day. And we sometimes, you know, and it's not that these are great things are not happening within our classes and our programs, it's just that as an institution, we need some sort of organized way in which we document those great things and those successes that are happening inside of our classrooms. So today, what I hope as we move through this presentation on core learning outcomes, this is not new, this is not a new concept. In fact, it's probably one of the slowest initiatives in the history of Northeast. Like, it feels as if it was something that started long ago and it's still very much in its early infant stages but i'm ready i'm ready and i hope other people will get ready with me to really dive in and get busy with these core learning outcomes and so today i hope to be uh, what I usually am with assessment. A cheerleader, I wanna get you excited as I possibly can. Uh, I have a really hard job because when I walk into the room or anyone sees me coming, it's usually connected with a negative. There she comes, you know. So I, I've tried to change that. So we have colorful, colorful graphic. That's one positive thing. And I thought, well, what could I, you know, what can I create to make this happy? So I played the song Happy. Dr. Barragona, I said, I'm, I'm thinking about a song. Like, what kind of song could be the theme for bringing these core learning outcomes back? She said, on the road again. <laughs> so we could have had that. And then I thought, no, I mean, it's rainbow. And I want, I want us to be happy. And cheerful and it's hard it's really really hard to get people cheerful right now like we've all been through now two years of you know 
and you're tired like I get that that's one thing I always want to be sure I remember is how it feels to, to still be in the classroom and you're tired and a lot's been asked of you um, there were some things that came about in the midst of core learning outcomes like pathways that made me say I'm going to put the brakes on let pathways come let let everybody kind of get their bearings with pathways and then we'll bring core learning outcomes back. So I made a meme and it's not to say that student learning outcomes are the donkey and core learning outcomes are the unicorn. It's just to say that when we have what we have always had is a set of student learning outcomes, utilitarian, basic, get students to the end, but with core learning outcomes, what I hope to show you today is why they are so important, how they can impact our students in a very positive way so that we can all kind of buy into this idea of why we should infuse them throughout the assessment process. Um, I've learned a lot along the way of this particular journey. Um, told you, I learned that it, it was gonna move slow Everything in education moves slow, right? We all agree with that. Except some things move fast, right? Like we're going to have ultrasound in the fall. Uh, but it wasn't a fast process. Many years we wanted it. Um, so, but what I've accepted is that things that move slow and steady, more like a, you know, a marathon, not a sprint, those are the things that can last. And so I don't think core learning outcomes is something that's going to come and go. I think it's something that as an institution we we will embrace and we will have these for a very long time. So objectives for today, I like to start with why. Um, if you ever took Maui or have listened to any of my stuff in the past, I love this guy. His name is Simon Sinek and he had a very um, popular TED talk where he talks about why. Uh, why it's important for people to understand their why. So when I speak about things related to assessment and IE, I always like to explain why it's critical and why it's important. Because if we all understand why we're being asked to do something, I think we, we can all agree to it a lot easier. We're gonna define the core learning outcomes more specifically than just the words themselves. Take a look at the timeline of you know, how it started, the, the journey it's taken. I'm going to talk about not particularly mistakes that I think I made or we made as, as an institution, but things that just haven't worked well so that we can maybe have a discussion on um, ways to fix that. Progress that we've made to date. And then, of course, you know, the vision for where we're headed with this. I don't expect you to read it, but anybody take a guess at what this is? It's our purpose. We call it our purpose um, statement, but it's our mission. <coughs> Wish it was our mission statement. It's caused a lot of confusion, but this is our purpose as an institution. And the part that I really want to focus on and that for me makes it easier for me as I think about institutional effectiveness and what we are here to do I mean, obviously we said our student is, is what we're here for, but that student can take a couple of directions when they leave us. We're a two-year institution. Some of them stay much, much longer than two years, but you know, we, we are a two-year community college and what we are here to do is to prepare students, you know, to either transfer to a four-year institution or to go to work. So when we think about those skills and abilities that students need, we think about the outcomes that we set and what we're trying to teach them in the courses that we have them in and find those things that will help them be most successful when they leave here. So imagine a student in a crossroads, you know, they're, they're going to go one of two directions when they leave us and some of them are going to do both. And as core learning outcomes began, you know, as we began to discuss that, 
that was really at the forefront of the discussion is like what are those things that we have heard employers say are important what are those skills that we know would serve a student well no matter what decision they make from here and as natasha said assessment and ie is a requirement and i really really do not like ever putting a focus on it being a requirement but i felt like it was important to show you exactly where the requirement comes from from an accreditation standpoint this time so that you know it wasn't just a hey let's have some core learning outcomes because it sounds fun because nobody <laughs> thinks that's fun <laughs> um, but there is a very good reason about why core learning outcomes were born. Mm -hmm. So standard 8.2b, standard eight is about student achievement. And if you, if you remember, we've been through a recent um, reaffirmation. Our college went through reaffirmation recently. So a lot of time and um, effort was spent looking at the processes that we had in place and the things that we have done in the past, which a lot are the things that when assessment was came to be in the late 90s, I found that a lot of things had remained unchanged since the 90s. And so in the spirit of institutional effectiveness, which I think equates with the term continuous improvement, it didn't make sense to let things stay as they had been for all of those years. And one of the big areas that caught my attention was our general education assessment. I come from, for 15 years I was in radiologic technology, so I spent my time on the AAS side of the house, right? So an Associate of Applied Science degree, um, they do take a, a large portion of gen ed core but it's a little different because on the AA side of the house, you know, our general education, our general studies degree, that encompasses the whole gen ed core. And our gen ed plan for, I guess, since it had ever been developed, was um, it took pieces of, of some things. It would pull a little bit from here and a little bit from here and it was put together in a plan, and I, I would look at that and go, I, just, I, I mean, I just know there's more. There's more we can show in this story than just this. So standard 8.2b says that we identify expected outcomes, assess the extent to which we achieve these outcomes, and provide evidence of seeking improvement based on analysis of the re results for student learning outcomes. And this is specifically for gen ed. So, you know, whether you are on the AA side or the AAS side, it doesn't matter. This is a conversation we can all have and we can all think about. Um, breaking this down, um, in all of our programs, and when I mean programs, we have the general studies program, we have many health science programs, we have many CTE programs. Um, that was a change that happened, I don't know, several years ago when we went to general studies. And so that kind of changed the uh, way that we speak about it. And I had just kind of gotten my grasp on all of that when Pathways came up. And so then it's not that Pathways changes anything about our programs or our offerings, but it adds another layer in there of, of how we separate our students from an advising perspective. So. A lot of terminology and if you don't work with it every day it's a lot and one thing that you'll notice if you go to conferences and you listen to anybody speak about assessment or IE terminology varies greatly but we all do the same thing so this is really um, has a lot of clarity about what SAC COC expects institutions to do and it's not that we've not been doing it. I just feel like, and research shows, that most institutions struggle with the last part of this, providing evidence of seeking improvement based on analysis. So if you 
how to look at your IE plan. If you serve, how many TIE members are in the room? So about half and half. TIE stands for the Institutional Effectiveness Committee. And I think it's the coolest committee to serve on, but most of the members on the committee are like, made to do it, have to, but I mean, we sometimes have good food. We have in a while because COVID, but one day we'll have fun again. Um, but one thing I noticed is that top committee members carried the weight of the work on their shoulders. It was a very exclusive process, you know, versus an inclusive process. And so one thing I hope is that by the, you know, implementation of core learning outcomes and the involvement of more voices, and I'll, I'll explain how we've made progress in that area, but I want assessment to be everybody. Um, in the fall, I did a little PD, IE stands for it's everyone, because it is. If you work at Northeast, continuous improvement is within the scope of every one of our jobs. It doesn't matter if we work in a, you know, if we go to a classroom every day, if we work in the business office, if we're fine, like anybody, even our maintenance, everybody, we're all, we all should be striving to make improvements so that this institution and the services we provide are always improving for our students. So I think that was one thing that in the past it was like, oh, um, one person even said to me one time after I did a presentation, she came up afterwards and said, that's so interesting. Like I always thought Tyle was a secret uh, society or <laughs> secret, like we weren't supposed to know what, what went on in Thai, what, you know, what that means. And I thought, okay, we have to, we've got to do better about that because we are all a part of this process. Now you may not be the one who it falls on to, you know, physically fill in the plan, but all the work that we all do culminates into that plan for continuous improvement. And the evidence part, if you are a TIE member, you know that one of the things we did is we changed our columns. Even though it was probably the similar to what we had always done, just changing the wording to analysis of results. So we have our outcome. This is what we expect. This is the results that we have gathered for a particular period of time. We analyze those results to see how, you know, did it work? Did it not work? That's the, um, the part of the process that's so critical is because we, we want to see, like, did we do some type of intervention that made a difference? And then we show the evidence that that worked or did not work. And about that, a lot of people, um, I think, what I noticed, a lot of people had this idea they didn't want it to show if there had not been an improvement. They did not want to highlight things that might not have gone as planned. It's okay. That's what this process is for. It is okay to fail. Now, the important part is, is that we're continuously trying to make it better. It's not, if this, if your IE plan is glowing of, with perfection, it's probably, not the greatest, not the greatest thing. We, you know, uh, a plan that's real shows that it's really happening. So another reason why, I mean, the most important, I guess I should have switched and put this before accreditation. I was trying to, you know, get you to see this isn't just my idea. It's something we really need to do, but the improvement of student learning, and this can be defined as documented increases in student proficiency, that can reasonably be attributed to systematic changes in the learning environment. Does anybody have an example? Like, could anybody just throw out some example of something that, and it could be anecdotal. I'm not asking for something that you actually documented, but you saw something that needed to be changed and you did some kind of intervention and it made things better. Anybody got one? 
I know you all have one. That one, Carlina? She's our technology infuser. Um, okay, so just in anecdotal. Yeah. Teaching in class. Yeah. I found that I could kind of catch uh, the attention of my students a little bit better and be a bit more engaging <laughs> with live um, quizzes that they could even see and bring a little humor into the environment that I think helped improve assessments that way, like a Kahoot. Yep. Doing a little Kahoot at the beginning of class, throw a couple of goofball questions in there, make everybody laugh, lightens the environment, they're more engaged, they communicate better because they're not stressed, because we've just laughed before. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like that has helped, you know, it's improve my students. Great example. And we do that all the time. That was my point. I mean, we think about assessment as being this separate, formal, required, mean, accreditor, whatever, but, but it's, it's ongoing. You know, that's one of the things, that's a word we see in accreditation a lot. I mean, it's just an, it's ongoing, it's real, it's real life, it's what's really happening. And it's our effort to just always, you know, try something to help them be better, help, help the environment to be more conducive, help them learn better. And a lot of times that's happening just on the fly because, I mean, I remember I never had the same group of students twice. I mean bring in a group of people and there's all of these different personalities and you know different learning styles and some people will engage with you and some people won't and some people are non-traditional and some people I mean there's just all of these um, variables that come into play and as the instructor that puts you in a position where you just got to be able to be agile and make changes as needed. So talking more about why, why these particular outcomes, and we'll talk about them in detail. The way this came to be, uh, I've got a timeline, but I wanna go ahead and tell you just a little short story of how they came to be. We were preparing for the, the SACS visit and looking at what they were asking us to do. And in our catalog, we had three competencies they were called reading, writing, and mathematics. And if you've been here long enough, you remember that one of our QEPs focused on reading, so we had that like a lot. We All of our IE plans had some reading outcomes and we were measuring our students' reading ability. And in 2018, when I came in, we were being able to roll those out of IE plans and people were going, can I get rid of this reading? Yes, like everybody was ready to get rid of reading. And it's not that reading ability is not important, right? I mean, we all agree. And I'm, I would say, I don't think it's as much that they can't read as they don't read. Like they just don't read. I love to read, but a lot of people don't. Um, mathematics, absolutely, it's, it's critical. It's important that they have math skills. Writing, if you're an English teacher or you require any kind of writing in your class, I mean, it's imperative that they know how to write well. It's not always the easiest assignment for us to grade, especially if you're a non-English person, but it, you know, it's important, sometimes disappointing when, when they turn in writing assignments, I can remember that. So it's not that those three competencies were not okay. But go back to the donkey and the unicorn. I think we're better than just okay. Like we are pretty great here at Northeast. And what core learning outcomes do is they pull from a lot of different places. Two, you know, research-based places that they came from was something called the Degree Qualifications Profile and also the Council for Advancement of Standards in Higher Education. Um, and what these two entities have done through lots of different ways is they've compiled basically a repository of those 
knowledge, skills, and abilities that would serve students well in higher ed at all various levels. So they've got some, you know, expectations for associate level students, bachelor's level students, master's level students. And when you get in there and you start looking, you know, it's just like level learning in a plan, you know, our freshman level students, our expectations are not as great as they are for our sophomore students. And so it's the same concept. We have four of our five CLOs coming from these sources. The fifth, our digital fluency, that's not something that you find in either one of these, but it was important we felt to our institution because of our focus on the use of technology in the classroom. Digital fluency, if you recall, was the first CLO that we kind of tried to pilot and infuse into IE. And it was very, very basic. It, the outcome stated, students, let me get this straight, students will utilize the iPad in their coursework. Like it was just a very basic, it was never meant to be a permanent, outcome or permanent solution, it was more or less just to try and begin to get these core learning outcomes as part of our vocabulary and our way of thinking. And so I'm really proud that we have digital fluency um, because it's so much more than just the use of an iPad <coughs> in class, right? I mean, a lot of times it is something that they are doing with their iPad, but it's so much more than just taking a test or using it as a substitution as a textbook. There's so many great things that I know are being used, the iPad being used for in class. So as we prepared for the SACS visit, I just, I'm, I'm a wife. I probably was that kid that my parents were like, could you just shut up and quit asking why? But I would say to Dr. Barron, but why? Like, why is it that, you know, who, who decided on these three? Like, why are they so basic? You know, because we do so much more. Like, there's so many great things that I know are happening in the classrooms across all of our curriculum at this college. She's like, I don't know. I mean, they were already there. So, again, when I look back historically, a lot of what's in place was what developed in the late 90s and just nobody ever said why or what if, like what would it look like if we made some changes? You know, change scares people and not everybody loves change, but if you're not changing, you're not growing. So we've got to just embrace change. And if you've been in higher ed for very many years, we've seen a lot of change come about. So it's just something we kind of have to take a deep breath, even if it's out of our comfort zone and just roll with it. So again, those previous competencies, reading, writing, and math, the gen ed plan would have some data points pulled from individual divisional IE plans. And then in assessment, we know that multiple means, multiple means of measurement is a positive thing. It's always good to have a couple of ways of measuring something. And so our additional measurement was test score data from the ETSPP test. And I don't even claim to know, I, can, I don't know who, what students all take the ETSPP. I don't know if any counselors or success center people can help me out with that. But a large group of students take that test and there's different areas that get scored. So like on the math section, we would pull in the math, the, the reading, no writing would come from the ETSPP. So that was kind of how Gen Ed was being measured and it's still, at the moment, that's still how it's being measured. So that's what I'm hoping to change with core learning outcomes. So the timeline, I said it's been a long process. It started in the fall of 2019. Um, and a lot's happened since then. We've, we're in a pandemic. We've had a you know reaffirmation just a lot, a lot has gone on. So again, I'm fine with the fact that it's moved slow. So in the fall of 19, um, a qualitative analysis was done on all of our current student learning outcomes. 
So that was back when we still had all of the information in Canvas Labs and I went through every single plan and I coded every student <coughs> learning outcome into a category. Did this outcome speak to communication? Was it content knowledge? Was it critical thinking? Was it on and on? You know, there was a broad variety of things that I found, but what I found the majority to fall under was content knowledge, which is great. We need content knowledge in our areas, right? But what we were missing were those what we hear people refer to as soft skills. How well do they communicate? How well are they able to take complex problems and solve that in some kind of activity? How well can they collaborate with their classmate? Because again, when you think about what five core learning outcomes we've chosen, I, I feel like unanimously we would agree whether they go to work or they go to a senior college. They need to be able to collaborate with other people. They need to be able to speak, <laughs> write, um, solve complex problems. I think we're seeing a lot of detriment through the COVID situation of people in a, you know, unable to critically think through the barrage of information that gets you know, placed on them. And so all of those skills, if we embrace those and we infuse those into what we teach them in our in our courses i know that they will serve them well spring of 2020 clos was presented at top um still remember that day we had biscuits and chocolate gravy and it was fun yeah i had on an apron i was in the kitchen cooking and we we saw core learning outcomes for the first time I won't lie, in spring of 2020, I thought by the fall, we're gonna have these suckers implemented and underway, <clears throat> didn't it? Fall 2020, as you know, between that spring and fall, a lot of preparation, it, it got real. Like the on-site visit was happening, we had to have a report sent in, it, it just kind of got crazy and there was so much that not a ton of focus got placed on the, the CLOs. But we began to talk about if we, if we have these CLOs, how, how do we measure them broadly? If you've got English courses that are measuring written communication, but you've also got it happening over here in a psychology course, like how do we bring that all together? How do we measure that in a much broader way than we've ever done before. Because remember, we've up until now, we've never attempted anything on this scale. Um, that same semester, academic faculty, academic as in our academic divisions, went through uh, curriculum mapping. Um, you remember curriculum mapping? It was, we had to do it kind of, I think, every discipline was in their own spot. So we, we did this by discipline. It was just the only way I could think to make this make sense. So all of our disciplines got together and they determined, they, they had their state curriculum objectives in front of them and everybody in that discipline. So an example would be biology. Every teacher who taught biology gathered in a group they looked at all of their course objectives for all BIO courses, and they came up with a set of what we named DSLOs, Discipline Specific Learning Outcomes. If we were a four-year college, that would be like a school of business or a school of education coming together and saying, all students who travel through the coursework in this, in this program, these are the expectations as faculty that we have for them. So that was kind of the idea, but because we're two year and we are structured by academic divisions where in disciplines don't always, there's not always a connection between the disciplines, this was just the best way that we could do it. In my opinion, I, I don't know, I had a lot of good feedback about the curriculum mapping. I heard the comment, this is the first time I ever felt like I was a part 
of this. And that's good. That's what I wanted. Remember, inclusive. Um, they came together. Some of you were in those disciplinary groups and had really great discussions, I think, about you know, what expectations you have for students that go through. So from there, we went to spring of 21, and that was a professional development that taught how to get those outcomes into Canvas and make those connections to gather the data. If you don't remember, again, it was remote because of COVID. It was, the, it was a video and we used Memojis. It was several people, like little talking heads. I don't know that that was the best way to, to get that information across, but it was just the only choice we had. You know, a lot of the things we've done have been out of necessity. Um, I think we all prefer face-to-face -face where we can talk and we can, you know, have discussions, but that just didn't allow for it at that time. One of the things that came from that is while Canvas is amazing and we can use it for so many great things, I don't know that this is the is one that we can. Um, and the reason is, it's it's a, would you agree if you've ever done it, it can be a little tedious. It can be a little, if you don't click this before you click this, then at the end of the semester, you're out of luck. Like, it didn't do what you needed it to do. And that was disappointing because when you think about assessment at scale like this, where we're trying to bring a lot of different disciplines together and assess one of these CLOs, there's got to be some manageable way to do that. And I thought Canvas was the answer, but I'm here to say I, I changed my mind. I don't think it is. I think that there's going to be a better way. And while it's probably not as technologically savvy as using Canvas, it'll get the job done. And sometimes, as I think we would agree, it doesn't always have to be fancy or high tech to work. I just think you've got to say, you know what, if we need to put that data into Excel in OneDrive, then that's how we need to do it. And that's probably, I think, will be how the most manageable way will emerge. Fall 21, so last fall, I kind of had to press pause because the Pathways Initiative rolled out really fast, really like, woo, Pathways. <laughs> And I, I could, I like, I know how to read the room. And I read the room as not the time to put anything else on anybody. Like people are tired, people are stressed out from COVID, pathways is new. I said, it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause, pause on those. And then when the time is right, I'll bring it up again. So here we are. I'm ready for us to move forward, even if it's really, really slow. I just feel like this is so, so critical. So here they are. These are our core learning outcomes. Quantitative literacy, collaboration, communication, digital fluency, and critical thinking. So quantitative literacy is defined with these, these things, this basic premise. But one of the things that I always try to stress while at first glance you think quantitative, like that's math. Everybody thinks that's math, that, that's math. Not necessarily, because if you think about it, these skills are found throughout many parts of our curriculum. Students can do accurate representation of quantitative information on political, economic, health related, or technological topics and explain how calculations and symbolic operations are used in those offerings. So that's not just in a math class, that happens in a lot of places. Students will create and explain graphs or other visual depictions of trans relationships or changes in status. And I mentioned that I think um, we see a lot of misinformation these days, but we also see an inability of people to interpret information. And that's what I see when I look at quantitative literacy. Learning how to take some visualization and in their mind work through what it is that that's telling them. So as you think about your own curriculum, think about places in it where quantitative literacy would come into play. 
collaboration. What is something that you think in today's time with our students today, what limits their ability to collaborate? Are they real good at communicating with each other? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? They're always on a screen. They're always on a device. They have learned their, like their whole existence of communication has been in an electronic format. So that becomes an issue for all of us with our students, no matter what field they're choosing to go into or what they do, but I, my heart's healthcare, and I think about like their inability to communicate with a patient. Like 15 years ago, even they struggled, so I can't even imagine. Like, I'm not even 15. Now, almost 19 years ago, <laughs> like it was bad. You know, they sometimes would struggle with that face to face. And so, by infusing activities and pushing them into a collaborative environment, they apply knowledge of subject matter in group discussion or class discussion. I figure we all do try to, you know, to incorporate group work into what we do. And I, I know there's gonna be differing opinion on group work. I'm not saying that it should be a high stakes graded, because we've all been in group work before where we were the one that did all the work and other people got the credit. So to find ways to promote collaboration um, might be a little, might take some creative thinking, but the important thing is that they learn how to work together in a group. I think that would be important no matter what setting they go to later. Huh. Back to that communication again, not only don't they do they not know how to work well together, but when you put them in a group, probably there's a lot of silence. Uh, you know, they don't know how to verbally communicate with one another. Um, also written communication, writing those papers, taking information and making it their own, being able to, to turn multiple sources into something with their own ideas. And then again, effective group communication by responding to others. So we we could go a couple of ways with communication, but verbal and written are the ones that we put a big focus on with these CLOs. Digital fluency is defined by maintaining and managing a variety of digital tools and resources and use those resources to access relevant and reliable information. And I know that's happening. I know that with the iPad in hand, that may be one of the things that they do best is to use that, that device to find information. I think the key word here would be reliable. You know, how do you, how do you use a device to find things that you can trust? You know, how do you um, use that device to probably the biggest thing is to create you know again it's more than just taking a test or reading a book but what can we um, encourage where they use those iPads to actually use multiple um, applications to turn something in and finally and this one this is a tricky one because it's kind of hard to measure critical thinking you know uh, a lot of that is inherent to the person, but it's defined as students demonstrating critical thinking by identifying important problems, questions and issues, analyzing, interpreting, and making judgment of the relevance and quality of information, and assessing assumptions and considering alternative perspectives and solutions. I don't know about you, but this becomes more important every day. Like, their ability to use their critical thinking is so important. In healthcare, keep going back to healthcare because it's what I know, it would be this way in any field. But sometimes in healthcare, not sometimes, almost all the time, things are coming fast. People are, you know, patient, they're changing. Their status is changing. You're being asked to do multiple things at the same time, and that can be overwhelming have to have this ability, but it is very hard to teach 
Um, my, in my experience, it was best and easiest to teach it through um, activities where they had to just practice, you know, do things they practiced it. But, and then it's even probably more difficult to kind of measure. Progress to date, so we have the CLOs, okay? I feel like the CLOs are sound, they're good, they are the things we would agree are important. We've done curriculum mapping, which that was the first time in our whole history as a college that anybody is aware of that that happened. And we have had a development of those discipline-specific learning outcomes, which was another first. And they are going to serve as the precursor to using CLOs in gen ed program assessment. So, what we've done in your IE plans, all of, almost every program, every IE plan, instructional IE plan has done alignment between CLOs and their existing student learning outcomes. And that's amazing, like a lot of alignment is there. When we rolled it out and said, well, why don't we measure these in Canvas? I think that's where this took a turn yeah, kind of went off the tracks. It was just too much, it was too difficult, it did not work well, we don't have the manpower for it. So that's when I said, it's a good time to pause because I need to figure out what we can do differently. I think we need to start small and not that Gen Ed is small, it's gonna be big, it's gonna be a big deal. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna form a Gen Ed committee. That's gonna be people, instructors from all of the Gen Ed the Gen Ed core areas. They're gonna to come together as disciplinary groups and say, for all of the students who go through the general studies program, these are the things that are important and they're gonna be based on these core learning outcomes. And just because it's the Gen Ed instructors doesn't mean it excludes anyone because those students are then gonna filter into your programs and your courses. So we're all gonna work together, but we're gonna let the Gen Ed, let it lead and guide this process for us. Um, the plan is gonna be higher quality. Um, I believe that the evidence that we are able to provide through putting a plan like this together is just gonna be an amazing way to tell our students, tell any interested person, whether that's parents, the students themselves, if we have to answer to legislators, if we need to answer to anyone in our communities, we can say our students, when they finish at Northeast, they, they possess these skills and abilities that are going to be amazing if you hire them or if they transfer to you. So I think it's an exciting time. I think it's important. I think there's a lot of things that we all agree. I think that the, the challenge will be to just take it small steps and let it come together. So just to kind of finish up, is education's purpose to develop morally good people or prepare students to become workers? Well, I think it does both, and that's kind of an age-old um, debate in higher ed. Like, what are we here for? What really are we here for? And if, you, if you've ever taken history of higher ed, you know that the earliest people would have said, well, we want to we develop morally good people. And I think we still want to do that, but we also want to prepare students to go out into this into society and be good workers who possess these skills in alignment with our mission or our purpose by preparing them for employment or transfer these core learning outcomes identify those areas that will make students stronger I explained the gen ed assessment so be kind of you'll you'll hear about this these liaisons will be tie committee members that don't already serve working on another plan. I hope that we will continue to infuse these CLOs through our entire curriculum. Just because we're gonna measure them broadly in Gen Ed doesn't mean I want them to disappear from anywhere else. It's important to show students that throughout their journey, they are learning these things and being exposed. I wanna put more focus on students here. 
you know, we we talk about them. They're the reason that we do what we do, and we, you know, we say we're doing it for the students. We want our students to be successful, but we don't many times involve them in the conversation. So I want to do a better job of helping them know what they're getting from their time and effort that they spend here. And finally, the ultimate goal is just improvement. You know, improving our learning for our students to be their best. Sounds like we're out of time. I had a lot more planned, but I don't have time to, to you know, do any activities. But just, like, anybody have any feedback on this? It's just, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts. I mean, these five core learning outcomes, is this something you can buy into? Is this, are these skills you think are important? I think like what you said about the canvas, like we went in and we linked, is in the report, yeah. we, we don't know what the outcomes yeah, are. Yeah, we don't. The reports are extremely data heavy, like you run one and the columns, in, I mean, it's enormous. And if you don't have a lot of Excel skills, it was kind of worthless. And we don't have anyone that has the time to sit and clean that kind of stuff up. So, so. do you want us right now to even the upcoming semester, do you want us trying to attach those CLOs to our assignments if we're going away from that? No, I think if you want to, if, if, if you're one of those that did it and was finding value in it, by all means keep doing it. But as far as the, the big picture, I'm, I'm going to go a different direction because it just wasn't, well, it's not a feasible solution for all. I got a question. Yeah. Um, when these student learning outcomes, are we free to change, modify them, or who sets those up? Do you remember when you did curriculum mapping yeah. with your discipline? So that was the, to my knowledge, that was the first time that faculty as a whole had been involved in that decision making process. But to answer your question, absolutely free to change. And that was kind of a misunderstanding that I heard a lot of people say when I came into the role. Oh, we can't change our outcomes. We can't change our outcomes. Sometimes you need to. Like, if you so have to change them, what do we need to do? Send them to you? Well, so that becomes a divisional thing where you, as a group, say, hey, it's time to change this, this outcome. And then that's what you begin to measure as part of your divisional plan. But yeah, I mean, things change. Sometimes we measure an outcome, obviously, like some of the ones still around since the late 90s. I mean, some things have changed. <laughs> some of our expectations may have changed. Some, sometimes it's not even changing an outcome as much as it is changing the tools in which we measure it. You know, maybe we we'll try something different, showcase a different thing, find out is this working better than this work? It's kind of a in research, pre-test, post-test, intervention. Like, how can I, how can I establish that what I've done is actually having a positive impact? <coughs> Anything else? Thank you, thank you sweetie. Uh huh. All right. Well, thank y'all so much for coming. I hope you have a wonderful semester, and I'm here if you need me for anything.